Hello, thanks for joining us this evening, especially our online guests. We have plenty of guys in here right now ready for a nice training. So um, tonight we are going to be doing training of the art of troubleshooting. Um, just basically going through some basic uh, procedures. <laughs> I'm not good at this, so I apologize. Um, wanted to do some housekeeping for um, our online viewers. Um, you'll see like a little portal in front of you right now. Obviously the video is in the middle. There's a question and answer section. Feel free to ask questions throughout the whole, uh, the whole time here. Um, there are some slides and polls that we want you to kind of look over and see. Um, there is a resource download where um, we have a coupons offer for tonight as well as um, a checklist and I believe some uh, product brochures and whatnot. Um, there's a survey and then if you guys are needing a certification at the end, um, there's a little timer on there. Stay on as long as you can and ask as many questions as you want. <laughs> All right. Um, also, best viewing tips, don't try to stream Netflix while, watch, while streaming this. It's probably going to screw you up. Um, try not to use your phone. Use a desktop or a laptop. Um, and then uh, I think Chrome works best for this one. Don't use the Firefox. Um, 20, or 48 hours after this event, you can actually come back on using the same link that you got and view it again if you need to. And I think we're... Uh, ready to go. I'm Rachel Cox. I'm the customer service manager um, here. And this is uh, Phil Kimball, a bright shiny star. Um, he is the product development manager. Um, he is going to be doing most of the talking, so you don't have to deal with me being nervous. <laughs> You're doing great, Rachel. You're doing great. Let's get right to a quick hand, guys. Come on. I just wanted to prove to you the online audience, we actually have people here tonight. That wasn't canned laughter or canned applause. So, they're real people here. So, some key takeaways from this training um, is just uh, make it easy to diagnose um, any issues that you have in the future, whether it be zone control or a thermostat, anything. Um, learning some diagnostic methods, and then also just expanding critical thinking skills. That's what we're here for, so. All right, Phil, you oh, ready? That's right. Well, I don't know why we call this uh, the art of troubleshooting. I've always felt that troubleshooting is a real pain, uh, but maybe there is some art to it. Um, how many in our audience out here uh, install zone control systems? Okay, just about everyone. Uh, are any companies uh, involved where you one guy does rough ends, another guy does the wiring, another guy does the, the, the landing. Uh, so, in other words, you got four or five different hands involved in putting in a zoning system. Well, I think that's a good place to start with regards to zone control. Um, or any system that you might install in the heating, air conditioning industry. Don't ask me about fuel injection tonight or turbochargers. I am clueless when it comes to that. I've, I'm not trained in that endeavor, but I have been trained in heating air conditioning products and especially in the controls field. That's been my endeavor for over 50 years. Doesn't mean I'm smart, just means they beat it in my head so darn much that I can't forget this stuff. Um, when you're putting in, and we're going to talk zone control tonight, but it can apply to other systems, humidifiers, dehumidifiers, whatever you're doing, especially if there's more than one individual involved. Um, think about the other person. If you're doing a rough in, and especially with zone control, uh, tonight we're focusing on what we call home run wiring. Everybody knows what that means? Home run wiring. You know the difference between that and daisy chain systems? Well, I'll tell you the difference. Daisy chain systems, I can't diagnose them over a telephone. They're absolutely impossible. And typically, daisy chain systems, you have to have special diagnostic tools like computers, laptops, to figure out what's going on because everything is a communication link, one device to another, to another, to another. What we do in zone control and what most companies do unless you get into the real big 
uh, commercial control systems is we home run wire. And that means that we take the components of a zone <laughs> control system and we bring all those components back to what we call a logic panel. And so when you're pulling wire, when you're putting in zone dampers, you're installing zone thermostats, and you're bringing all this stuff back to the panel. One thing you can do for the next guy who's got to look at this or do the test check and startup procedures or do troubleshooting <laughs> later on is tag your wires. Tag them. If I have a system that has three, four, even more zones, which means an individual thermostat and a damper or multiple dampers serving that zone, and I'm running all this wire somewhere in a basement, uh, an equipment room, and it's all hanging down here, and now I gotta figure out where does these wires go, which thermostat is this, what damper is this, it's best to tag it all. Now, I'm not talking about using terminal designators. You can do, if you want to use designators, go ahead. I'm talking about take that bundle. Once you know where zone one thermostat is, and once you know where what associated damper is serving that zone is, when you bring those wires in, take a piece of tape, wrap it around, and say zone one. And you can put zone one D, damper, zone one T, thermostat. That's all you have to do, and it's going to make the guy who has to land this stuff's life so much easier. Amazing the number of calls I get, and we get here at Jackson Systems, and I'm sure other companies get the same thing. Well, your system isn't working. Your relays are backwards because zone one thermostat's calling and zone one damper is closing. And I can assure you that can happen in a couple ways. But I can assure you that a lot of times it happens only because they didn't know what zone one damper was. They had zone two damper wired to this thing and zone one damper somewhere else. <laughs> so if you tag your wires starting out, it's gonna make life easier for everybody, even when you have to go back to that job sometime and do some troubleshooting. Um, always, I preach this all, all the time, always use a separate 24 volt VA rated, properly rated transformer. Don't use the equipment transformer. We don't, we don't know what the VA rating is on the equipment transformer. A lot of guys say, oh, it's 40 VA, it's plenty. Depending on the type of dampers, the number of zones you're using, uh, it may not be enough VA. And we like to isolate ourselves from the equipment. And I'll get into that a little later, but we want to isolate ourselves. I don't want to touch that equipment transformer. I want to use a separate transformer. And I know Hicks Air, you guys use them. Jim is, I beat it into his head, and he's religious about it now. Um, uh, and it isn't like we like to sell transformers because we don't make a lot of money on them, but we do sell a ton of them because we preach that. Use a separate transformer. A uh, couple other things. If you can, and whoever has got to sign off on this job, this system installation, make sure you go through thorough test check and start. Don't make assumptions. You know, well, I ran the AC, it's working, and you leave, and then all of a sudden the homeowner or the end user wants heating and they can't get any heat, now you got to make a call back there to the job. And every time you get a call back, it costs your company money and usually the bosses don't like that. So if you go through thorough test check and startup when the job has been installed, and if you then run into problems during that time, uh, you can call us, call tech support while you're at the job, while you're on the job, not when you're in the truck, not when you're back at the shop, call us when you're there and we can walk you through a real simple troubleshooting um, of any of our systems, which you're gonna learn tonight, and then you're gonna make my job easier, and I won't have to do tech support anymore, and I can retire <laughs> next week, okay? That's why, this, this is why we're here tonight. <laughs> I'm getting old, and I don't wanna do this anymore. Okay. So. Yes. So, things that we've covered just from this. Home run, home run wiring, right? 
That's what we're talking about. Yep. Then also uh, tag in your wires, make sure that they're landing correctly. And then basic, basic install. And you got any more? All right. Oh yeah, I got tons of things. <laughs> First of all, uh, you don't go to a gunfight without your gun, right? Well, well, you yeah. don't go out to a zone control job without the proper diagnostic tools. And let's talk about those <coughs> tools. Uh, you got a problem. Oh, you know, something is going on. We got to have diagnostic tools. There you go, guys. You want to have a... You guys are the hands-on people. We got all this beautiful, bright light studio and everything you want to have a really good light source whether you're wearing a uh, a light a lamp, a lamp or mm -hmm. whatever but you got to have a good light because most of the time uh it's crawl spaces dingy basements attics and you got to be able to see these very small terminals uh next thing important you want to have the right type of screwdriver we give these away Every time there's a will call order that goes out the door, guys are grabbing these screwdrivers. Now, I don't know whether they're trying to sell them on eBay or what, but we give away <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of these screwdrivers because they're important. They fit the terminal screws on the zone control panels, and not just ours, everybody's. Uh, another thing, jumper. These are so cool. I like, I use these a lot. <laughs> These are magnetic jumpers. Yeah, see, there you go. Yeah. These are neat. Um, but you don't really have to, you know, you don't really need these uh, because all you need is a hunk of thermostat wire. But rather than, uh, when you're on a job, rather than having to dig around and see if you can find a piece of thermostat wire that was happened to be left on the job, make yourself up a bunch of little jumpers like these. These things are neater than heck and they are absolutely important when you're doing diagnostic work on a zoning system. Jumper wire. Um, the old faithful. Gee, mine isn't even as fancy as this, but <laughs> the old multimeter. You know, what, what can we do with this? Just about everything. Uh, we can do, we can test for ohms value. We can do continuity testing. We can check voltage. Uh, we can do we can do all kinds of things with these meters. You need these. You have to have them with you. That's probably the Bible of the HVAC controls business, your multimeter. Um, but with those simple diagnostic tools. And you your can, installer manual, right? Oh, well, yeah, sometimes. <laughs> uh, you can diagnose. You can. Those are the tools you use to diagnose the system. Now, yes, it would be nice to have the installer manual. But as we know, especially if we go back to a job, or maybe a job that is, we didn't install. It was installed by someone else. We got, uh, we got the call from the client, and they want us to come out and figure out what's going on. And you get out there, and uh, the actual zone control panel looks just like this. The cover's gone. The lid was thrown away. Uh, there is no manual. Uh, you can get online, and all you need to do is identify the panel and all the panels are clearly identified on the printed circuit board and if it's a io systems panel or it doesn't matter guys if it's troll attempt or if it's california economizer typically you can get on their websites or online and you can get their manual because there are some differences between manufacturer zoning systems there are even differences between the I.O. line of zone control systems with regards to some of the function. But overall, they all do the same thing. Why do I even need a zone control panel? Can anyone even tell me that? Why do I even need this thing? What is the important thing to know about diagnosing an issue with the product? First of all, you need to know the product. You need to understand it. The more you endeavor uh, and read and learn, the easier it's going to become to diagnose, install, do all these things because you learn, you really begin to know the product. 
And I just want to give you a, just a few basic things about a zone control system. First of all, it's not magic. It is not rocket science. It is so simple. But what makes it seem confusing to a lot of techs out in the field is, and there's a lot of wires running in that thing. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of thermostats installed and there's a lot of zone dampers. But all that panel is, is the little black box that allows multiple thermostats to be able to control a single piece of equipment. Years ago, I had a guy who said, I don't need your zone control panel. I'll just put a thermostat upstairs and thermostat downstairs, and I'll just wire them to the terminals on the, eight, on the air handler. And, and he said, and when I need heat upstairs, I, I can turn the heat on or tell, set, point, set the set point for what I want upstairs. And when I need cooling downstairs, I can set the set point for what I need cooling downstairs. But here's the old problem. If you had a thermostat to call for heating and cooling at the same time, guess what? The furnace is on and so is the AC and you don't have any control of that air distribution. In other words, you don't have any damper control. So it really doesn't work. So what zone control does, it looks at the incoming calls from thermostats, zone thermostats, and it determines what mode of operation to put the equipment in based on the control algorithm, as we call it, of that specific panel. Uh, there's First call priority, these are very common ones. First call priority, whichever zone calls first, establishes the equipment mode of operation. That's all you have to worry about. If a zone calls in an opposite mode, it has to wait and take its turn. And then we could change over and go after the opposite call. That's called first call priority. Majority wins, that's another common control algorithm. Three zones are calling for heat, one zone calls for cool. Well, guess what? Heat wins. It's the majority. That's how that works. And there's other control algorithms, but this, because now we've, we've progressed into using a microprocessor, we can do a lot of neat things that would have taken a lot of relay logic to do years ago, and, and we did that, but we got a little compact panel now that can just about do everything for us, and we don't have to worry about uh, basically what's going on with the panel because if you call here or you go out and you see that well lightning whacked the house or the building and you know the panel's blowing apart well guess what it's dead and you don't have to ask for support you need to call in and ask about warranty replacement uh, but when you walk in and you first see a panel and you say holy mackerel all these wires and everything how do I figure out this what's wrong that's where we're going to get into diagnostics. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk briefly about, this is a little three zone panel, but it's a good way to uh, really, Rachel, just to show the things that are happening in a panel, yeah. you know, a zone control panel. Uh, this is our piece of equipment, pretty cool there, got a light. And the only reason is because uh, I don't, we, didn't, <laughs> we didn't have an air handler to drag in here and hook up to this, we could. But that's our equipment light. It's on. And it's on because I got a call for heating uh, in, a, a, in zone one. Well, we got one thermostat wired up to this. We got a zone damper associated with that thermostat. This is zone one damper, zone one thermostat. It's calling for heat. And on these boards, everybody's panel, they use, especially uh, on our panels, but, but most, of the, most of the zone control manufacturers out there, they use LEDs, LED indicators. They're great diagnostic uh, support tools because they give you a visual indication of what this panel is doing. If you didn't have LEDs on there, or in some cases, panels even have an LCD display. They're displaying information with regards to what's going on in the panel. Uh, you would have to, you'd have to use more of this stuff. And got a question here. Yes. Real quick. Um, question here is so you can set up thermostat in heat and cool. Absolutely. Copy. Yes. Because the every panel is has auto changeover capability. <clears throat> 
So I could have a thermostat set in cooling mode. I could have a thermostat set in heating mode. And worst case scenario, I'm doing a startup on a job. I'm getting ready to put power to this panel. And I have a thermostat that is pegged in cooling, and I have a thermostat that is pegged in heating. In other words, the set points are extremely high or low. And as soon as I apply 24 volts to that panel, I have two simultaneous calls in opposite modes. Heat cool, just like that. Well, majority wind, that doesn't work. First call priority doesn't work because they both called at the same time. Well, built into the computer algorithm is a fail safe. And if that happens, cooling wins. Now, is that typical with just ours, or do you see that more with? Most panels on the market, yes. <coughs> cooling will win. So we don't even have to worry what the thermostats are set in when we power this panel up because we're not going to bring on the heating and the cooling at the same time. Um, and that's one nice thing about zone control is you can have auto changeover capability. Larger homes, based on you know uh, um, exterior loads on the house, interior loads in the house, uh, you know big homes today, a lot of glass, a lot of solar. And you may need some heat in the morning, and by afternoon you need cooling. And that's very typical in larger zoned applications. Commercial applications, even more important, where you see the interior uh, load in the building begin to rise, the heat rise because of equipment, lighting, people, everything else. And by, you know, mid morning or afternoon, boom, you're in full cooling. And if you don't have auto changeover, you know, you got some issues. Now you go around change thermostats and that's not the way we do it. Leave the thermostat in auto, let it do its thing. Um, so any other that, questions? No questions here. Does anybody have any questions so far? We good? Yes. So in a farm It's, it's basically uh, based on satisfying one call but on, on whoever won first, you know, so to speak. So let's say we're in the cooling mode, but during that cooling call, uh, we get it. Excuse me. Can you repeat the question just for the people listening and didn't hear what he asked? The question was, like, we have a two-zone system, and we got a heating call, and we got a cooling call, and is there any type of time involved before we would change over? Um, First of all, typically no. In other words, if cooling wins, we're going to run cooling until the call is satisfied, and then we'll change over to the heating call if it exists, if it's still there. However, <laughs> in some commercial applications, we saw where this could be an issue. Uh, the old doctor, lawyer, Indian chief syndrome, where the lawyer decides to go play golf, and he cranks his thermostat way below a comfort level. He, he turns his thermostat down to 65 degrees cooling, and he leaves, and it's a multi-tenant type application. Now we can't ever get out of cooling. We just keep calling for cooling, cooling. Now these other offices are getting colder. They want heat. Um, what we have uh, in, built into all our panels, and, and on some of the larger panels, it's selectable. You can select this. It's called timeshare. So timeshare puts a curfew, so to speak, on the amount of time you can be in one mode, and it's 20 minutes. So if you had a heating call and you start out with heating, and shortly thereafter or whenever during that call you get the opposite call, cooling calls takes place, and if you're using the timeshare algorithm, then we will only let that mode run for 20 minutes. And if, and only if there's an opposite call taking place, we'll change over and go over the, after the opposite call. That's called timeshare. Uh, it's unique to the IO products, but uh, it really helps when you're looking at a lot of these different applications in zoning. I'm not sure if we answered this one or not, but. Um, would I need a second system and zone panel or dedicated systems to run both heat in one area and cool in another? I think we kind of covered that. Well, you can't 
you know, we all know you can't run heating and cooling at the same time with one piece of equipment. And um, maybe in some big commercial jobs where you have electric reheat or something like that, but no, it, one piece of equipment, we're either going to be in heating or we're going to be in cooling. But zone control, if used and installed properly, if used properly with regards to its design, you're not going to see those issues. You may see changeover, but you should never zone a building or get involved in an application where, and I'll give you an, a, big, a good example, where you have a constant cooling demand and you have a constant heating demand. Can't zone like that. You gotta zone with equipment first and then look at like load conditions to be able to, to apply zone control properly. Um, the most, uh, disastrous application I, I run into all the time is, well, they had a, co a light commercial job, had uh, 10 or 12 zones on it, and these were all offices, perimeter areas, no problem there. They had uh, a, a, an RTU for a core area, so they, 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 laid, they had the equipment working right, but they decided to zone the equipment room where, you know, the computers, the mainframe was. Well, it, that thing was constant cooling all the time. And then they wondered why, you know, well, we can't, you know, we keep changing over, changing over, changing over. Well, by the time they satisfied the cooling call and then we change over and try to heat some zones up, they lost everything they achieved in the computer room and bang, they had to go right back to cooling again. That's not a good application. Like low conditions and then you can zone just about anything. Um, I think we go back to diagnosing the problems, right? Okay. <clears throat> Well, we, we're, we're going to have some things for you guys downstairs. We'll, in fact, they're all ready. We, I whacked all these panels out downstairs, so you're going to have fun tonight diagnosing these problems. But when you look at forced air zoning, mm -hmm. you've got this panel, and since we call this home run, you've got a panel that it basically has inputs and outputs, period. That's it. This thing's like a big thermostat in, a, in its own way. It's the brain of the operation. It is. Right? But Everything you have, is. that's all you have. You have inputs and you have outputs. Inputs, <laughs> thermostats. Don't control thermostats. Your thermostat. Don't care what, whose they are, what they are. Uh, keep in mind, in most zone control systems, the thermostat has to be compatible with the equipment. In other words, if this is a heat cool panel, gas electric, I need to use conventional thermostats. If this was a heat pump panel, which this one is, I need to use heat pump thermostats. If it's dual fuel, hybrid, heat pump with a gas furnace, which we have a lot of that in the Midwest, still needs to be a heat pump thermostat. And unfortunately, there's a lot of jobs that are installed where it's a heat pump and a guy goes out and takes a conventional thermostat and then wonders why it won't work. You know, there's no input for a reversing valve. There's, you know, nothing from the thermostat. So, rule of thumb, thermostat needs to be compatible with the equipment. So, that's an input. These are all inputs. And, and basically, it's redundant inputs. Zone 1, zone 2, zone 3, etc. And then, you have an output. Dampers. These damper, this happens to be a three-wire damper. Power open, power close. <laughs> We also can provide two wire dampers, power close, spring return open, and all of the zone control panels today from I.O. have normally open and normally closed contacts on the damper side. So I can use a two wire damper or I can use a three wire damper. The advantage to a two wire damper, and years ago we always believed this was the best way to go, was if it's power close, spring open, if I lost the system, if I lost the panel, all my dampers fail safe in the open position. Thus, I could get a thermostat wired to the equipment and condition the entire, you know, space. Um, the improvement of dampers, the actuators that are used, the actual motors, it has been so significant 
in the last 10 years that power open, power close actuators are just as efficient as power close spring return actuators. Uh, a lot Lighting. of a lot of a lot of improvements. You, you know. can stick a lot more of the three wire ones um, in a in a single zone as well because yes. those two wires draw a lot more power. Uh, I think it's like 10 VA about. Yeah, two wire actuators they actually pull more uh, VA. They're they're 10 VA. This thing's like. Four or Two. less. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, amazing. You know, a three wire actuator, w basically nothing as far as VA. And yet, if you use two wire actuators, and we, and they're all rated, and you have to take that in consideration when you're zoning a system, you know, because if that transformer doesn't have enough VA to handle uh, the logic panel, the thermostats, and especially the dampers, then you're going to have problems right off the bat. Questions? We're going to get into some diagnostics here. So we got thermostats, their inputs. And like I said, don't care what kind of thermostat. They can be hardwired. In other words, I'm running 24 volts to the thermostat, or they can be battery powered, or they can be both. Uh, most of the thermostats today are, are what we call universal. In other words, you can configure the thermostat for a heat pump application or a uh, heat cool application or even a, a lot of them for... Uh, dual fuel, fossil fuel applications. So those are inputs, thermostats. I'm going to get yep. down to diagnosing it. Sure. This puppy up here. Yeah. All right. Oh, so question for you guys because I missed the last poll question. <laughs> well, um, I talk fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, what problems do you guys see a lot when out in the field when you're running into issues, particularly with zoning? Um, Damper motor failures? Okay. No, you don't run into any problems. <laughs> Wires aren't labeled, so we already talked about that. That's always a good thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Drywall, yeah. There, uh, sometimes there's conflict between... Uh, our industry and uh, the home builders, and you know, not not long ago, um, we were involved in a in a um, trying to support, do tech support on a job that all the dampers were sheetrocked in. You couldn't access them. Couldn't get to them. And, of course, the homeowner didn't, you know, wouldn't tolerate someone taking a saw and cutting big holes in their beautifully finished mm -hmm. basement yeah. ceiling. But that's exactly what had to be done. You need to be able to access everything. We've, had, we've seen jobs, and, and I have, just over the years, it's just incredible, where the zone control panel was buttoned in. They couldn't even get to it. Well, I don't know where it's at. Well, that's above the ceiling there, and it's all sheetrock, beautiful textured ceiling. Someone's going to have to cut a hole in there and find out where it's at. So uh, you want to be able to, well, that's really important, yeah. access uh, the components, There's the another, panel, the dampers, the thermostats, obviously. Another comment on here is uh, no returns in the zone spaces. Yeah, that's that's more application. Good zone control means returns in every zone that's the ultimate can you get away with it without doing it yes but it's not as efficient it's not as e you will lose a little bit we need a lot of return air because i'm shutting off areas and i need return air and of course we have to consider bypass and we talk about that that's kind of zone control 101 if i close off half the duct work in a system my static pressure goes like that and I have to have a way to relieve that static pressure. There's two ways to do it. Conventional bypass, which can be barometric, or it can be electronic with a static pressure control. And all we're doing is taking the increase in static pressure and we're bypassing it back into the return through a barometric damper or a static pressure controlled bypass damper. So if I'm running a 0.5 or whatever my design static pressure is, I don't increase it when I'm closing zones off. 
And as zones open up, I allow that bypass damper to modulate close, closed or to the closed position if all the zones are calling. So we don't increase the static pressure, nor do we uh, decrease it, bypass. Today we have an electronic feature, it's called ESP. And we have found that in many, many applications, um, one of the biggest problems was you couldn't get a bypass damper in. This, I mean, physically, you just couldn't get the bypass damper in because you got to go from the supply to the return. So what an ESP system does is that it electronically um, controls non-calling zones using a static pressure controller. Static pressure controller goes in the main discharge air plenum of the system and it runs back to a panel uh, with an ESP panel. And so as the static pressure increases, what it does is it modulates the non-calling zone dampers to a point where the static pressure is maintained. And the small amount of air that is induced into the non-calling zones is not enough for them to deviate from their set point. This is, this is kind of a, a new technology. It's been on the market now uh, uh, through IO and some other companies. Uh, for about the last year and a half, but it's really caught on because it eliminates the need of putting a bypass damper in. Yes, sir. Is it selectable? Is it selectable? Yes. Yes. So if you had a is basement zone. Yes, it is selectable. If you had a basement zone and you didn't want, you know, you didn't want to have any air distributed in that zone when it's closed. Yeah. Uh, based on a the panel, there's selector pins. So you can say, I don't want that zone to be part of this only these zones, and then on some of the larger panels, you do it through an LCD programmer, but real simple. And it does save time and labor. Bypass dampers aren't fun to install, really. Uh, they can be real <laughs> demons. Uh, they're easy to set up, but they're not easy to install sometimes. Got a couple more for sure, you. Sure, go ahead. So some other, uh, some other common issues is uh, Typically, the largest issue that this person is finding is not identifying the wire, what wire goes where. Um, also, a second would be shorted wires due to not properly protecting the wires and the nail or screw gets, gets into those wires. Um, another one is uh, uh, problems with people having thermostats in different modes, not able to satisfy. Changeover. Um. Auto changeover works, it, it works fine, but there is a point of no return and this isn't our problem as the industry, as a contracting company. That problem relates to the end user. You zone a person's home. You explain to them that we can, relieve, we can remove or reduce that six, seven, eight degree difference between your downstairs and your upstairs because you only have one piece of equipment and you only have one thermostat in your home. Oh, by the way, guys, where's that thermostat located? Yeah, in the hallway. <laughs> the dining room. The yeah, well, it's <laughs> located in the hallway, which we never live in, or we never use the hallway. We walk up and down, but we don't stay there. And a thermostat can only control the temperature where it's located. And I always believe, I know why it's in the hallway, because the air handler is right below there, and that's the shortest wire run. Guy saved himself a ton of money, because he only had to run 15 feet of 18.6 or whatever. <laughs> so, uh, we don't live in the hallway. Uh, so, by putting the thermostat where you're going to occupy the space, um, you can control the temperature. But people say, well, okay, but then... They don't understand that a thermostat, any thermostat, doesn't work like the accelerator on your automobile. My wife believes that. She thinks the higher she sets the set point, or the lower she sets the set point, the faster it will get there. So, you know, if she want, if it's a little warm in the house, she do, she didn't take the AC set point and turn it to like 72. No, she'll peg it to 65. 
because she knows it's going to get colder faster, and we know it doesn't. <clears throat> so I think a lot of this has to do with educating, you know, the consumer, uh, the client, because zone control does what it's designed to do, but people can abuse the system. <laughs> and that can cause We're problems. We're not patient. Right. No, I'm not talking about, I'm talking about everybody. Oh, yeah. Uh, not, there isn't any uh, <laughs> discussion about women, uh, say, doing this. I just said my wife does it, but that doesn't mean everybody I think as a society, it. we're impatient. Okay, troubleshooting. So let's get this stuff out of the way so that way we can. Yeah, uh, we're going we're gonna to just run through some quick things because you guys are going to have a chance here in the audience to have a lot of fun uh, tonight downstairs. Oh, we got all this stuff glued. Okay. Ugh. I don't have a stage crew, so this is mm. not working. <laughs> <laughs> What model is this one? This is our HPS one. Yeah, it's a slow damper. But. All right. Probably that the most common problems that are addressed or that come through to our tech support group um, can be narrowed down to, and whoever that individual said, can be narrowed down to wire. Um, the thermostat isn't doing something that it's supposed to do. Uh, the zone dampers aren't doing what they're supposed to do. Um, we're not outputting to the equipment. And uh, in some cases, uh, the panel doesn't even work. There's no power to it. Well, 90% of everything you diagnose in a system can be done right here at the panel. Every, I mean, literally. And this this is where guys get confused. You know, wait a minute, I'll be right back. And you're running up the stairs to turn a thermostat on. You don't need to do that. That's what these things are for. Here's my thermostat if I'm doing diagnostic work. Now, I'll give you an example. We, uh, I took this jumper wire. And I went to this zone two, which doesn't even have a thermostat on it. And I just jumpered across R and G because these zone control panels have what we call independent, individual or independent ventilation mode. So if there's not an equipment call taking place, I can have ventilation air in any zone that I want, providing that that zone thermostat is in continuous fan. That's pretty cool. But watch what happens when I get an equipment call coming in. Now that damper is closed because this damper is associated with this zone one thermostat. So we'll make this thermostat call for heat if I can. And the reason we're using these in the heating mode is because we're eliminating time delays. When you get in cooling mode we got short cycle protection and all that stuff and you're sitting there waiting forever. Yes. Quick thing on the dampers. Um, is there an equivalent length for those zone dampers that we should keep in mind when um, we're adding it into the duct design? Um, oh, I would say don't go over 200 feet. <laughs> Literally. If you use an 18 gauge thermostat wire, 200 feet, but you can go further. Um, so in most applications, no, there's not, there's not a limit. And the same thing with the thermostats. You know, I could have a thermostat 200 feet away from the logic panel and I could have a damper 200 feet away from the panel. It's not going to, you're not going to lose that much uh, in wire. So 
I called, and it's hard to see, but these LEDs tell me a lot. I called for heating. W came on, this little LED. This is a power light up here. This LED is, is W for heating. This is a G fan light because this happens to be a heat pump panel. And it tells me that zone one damper, the green LED, is in the open position. And sure enough, it is. Now, if I take power off of this, or turn the thermostat off, this is the fastest way to do it, I will lose the heating call. It dropped out. I had that jumper wire across G, and sure enough, the fan LED came on, and this damper now is closing because I should be powering open zone two damper. So just using jumper wires, and here uh, is something that we try to do when we see fuses blowing. In other words, we fuse protect the inputs and the outputs of, our, of the panels. You've got a system fuse, and that means that 24 volts coming in, which is providing power to the dampers, to the thermostats, are, it's all fuse protected from the input from 24 volts. And that's that, with that separate transformer. That separate transformer. On the equipment side, we have an HVAC equipment fuse. Sometimes, depending on the panel, we have two of them. We have an RHRC fuse. Uh, this is a little panel, we have one. And that protects the panel from short circuits on the HVAC equipment uh, terminals to the equipment itself. So a guy calls up, he said, man, I'm blowing fuses. I'm blowing fuses. Well, which fuse is it? And uh, it's the system fuse. Well, if he's blowing fuses, then he's got a dead short. Now, I've got, let's say, would make it simple, but I've got three thermostats. And even if they're uh, a conventional heat cool thermostat, and it's hardwired, I've got five wires going to each one of those thermostats, and I have three zone dampers, and I have, if it's a three-wire damper, I have three wires going to each one of those dampers. Well, that's a lot of wire. Now, he says, well, I turned off the thermostats, I put a new fuse in, and as long as nothing's calling, the fuse is staying good. We're not shorting anything out. And, and he said, now you want me to go upstairs and turn the thermostat on? No! Why do you want to do that? You know, waste energy. I like, I like rock and share diagnostics. So here's what you do. You disconnect. You got three thermostats. Disconnect the hot wire going to each one of them. Now they're dead. They're out of the loop. Take the R wire or the hot 24 volt hot wire and disconnect it. See, if they're not hardwired and they're battery powered, well, we're still going to disconnect the hot wire. That way they can't do anything. They can call, they can do anything they want. We do that. We also disconnect the common wire going to each one of the dampers. Now I can't, I can't output. So, you do that, yeah, I got that all done. Now, now they're, they're always blaming the board. They're saying the board doesn't work. Well. You take your multimeter, you know, put it on AC voltage, and uh, and as long as you've got power to the panel, and you can confirm power here where you're coming in, but obviously I got an LED, I got 27 volts, and I can go across common and hot on every one of these terminals, and there's 26 volts, 28 volts. I can do that on every one of them because I'm using 24 volts in and I'm powering 24 volts out. If I go to the zone damper side and all my zone dampers are supposed to be in the open position, because I got light indicating that saying they're open, then that means that I have continuous 24 volts on common and PO, power open, period. That confirms 
that this panel is doing exactly what it's designed to do. Very simple. Now, the equipment side. First of all, we talked about the thermostats and we talked about the dampers because we don't care about the equipment right now. And it's always a good, I always advise people, hey, if we're gonna do some diagnostics, uh, take the hot wire off going to the equipment. I don't want to short cycle the compressor, you know, while we're doing diagnostics. So just pull the hot wire, the R wire. There is no common. There is no common on the HVAC equipment side on this panel because we isolate ourselves from that equipment transformer. And all we are is a switch. R to Y, R to G, R to W, R to reversing valve, whatever it might be. That's all we are. We're a dry contact closure. We're closing the hot leg to the equipment relays. Amazing how many people don't get that. Now, can I diagnose this though? Well, I don't have 24 volt common. How can, how can I use my meter? Well, you can use your meter in two ways. If I have a zone that's calling, so we'll turn this thing on, and for whatever reason, they're saying the equipment isn't coming on. Um, first thing we'll do, we, what we need to do is check that fuse, the system, or the HVAC equipment fuse, is it blowing, all right? Because we would see a heating call in this case, and we'd see that zone was open, and power, we got power to the panel, but we're not, we're, this light isn't coming on, let's say. That's our equipment. It's not working. I haven't done anything with it, but it's not working. Well, there's two ways you can do that. If it confirms, the panel confirms that W for heating is outputting, in other words, that W relay is closed, which means I've closed across 24 volt hot and W, then all I have to do is use continuity, tone. And I, you can, all meters have continuity. <clears throat> so I can, and if I have <clears throat> 24 volts, or, or, or if my relay's closed, you can hear it, it's made. Now, this isn't wired up to equipment. The other way I can test this is to put my uh, multimeter on AC voltage. And if I go across hot and the outputting call, W, I won't see any voltage. But if I were to go across hot and Y, or hot in any output that wasn't calling, I would see 24 volts, and that's the feedback voltage coming through the relay coils on the equipment. So you can do it two ways. I like tone, because that immediately confirms to me that relay is made. Now, the problem isn't here, it's wire. It's going out here to the equipment. Now before I get too far in that, I wanna get back to this. <clears throat> True, sometimes we have to go through the process of elimination to find the problem. But once you understand <clears throat> how to do it, it's pretty quick and you can get through it fast. Rather than blowing a fuse, sticking another one in there and blowing that one, and then sticking another one in there and blowing that one. I don't know how, why we do that. We, well, I blew a fuse, let me try another one. It's not the fuse, you got a dead short. They are, you know, they're just gonna blow and then you run out of fuses. Uh, if we keep blowing that fuse, well, we should only say, well, we blew a fuse, we just don't stick a new one in there. That isn't going to tell us where the problem is. We got all the hot wires removed. We got the commas removed going to the, uh, to the dampers. Now we go start the process of elimination. I take zone one thermostat, hook the hot wire up. Only that thermostat. And I make a call for heat, make a call for cool, make a call for fan. Everything functions. It's good. Now I take zone one damper and I hook the common back up. And if it works, all right, we go to the next zone and we go through that process of elimination. 
That's on the input sides and the outputs to the zone dampers. And usually it doesn't take long and all of a sudden, whoops, fuse pop, because I hooked up zone two damper, I know exactly where the problem is. I have a dead short going to that zone two damper and I can, I can you know, trace it out, find out where the short is and fix it. Um, not always, but, but I certainly recommend it. Um, it's always nice to have an extra wire in a bundle. <laughs> it really is because I can save you a lot of grief. Um, <clears throat> and again, um, the person who said about shorts and wires, mm -hmm. it's all, it happens all the time. Guy shoots a staple and he penetrates, uh, the bundle and he skins wires and you've got dead shorts. If you have an extra wire, sometimes you can get away, you know, without having to pull a new wire, especially on a job that's buttoned up, finished up. So that's why, again, I emphasize test, check, and start before everything's all finished up because that way that's going to save you a lot of grief in the long run. Now, on the equipment side, if I blow this fuse, I've got a short somewhere on the equipment. <clears throat> and I want to point out that RH and RC is going away. Years ago, we, had, we would have a, a, a piece of heating equipment that has a separate transformer. And we would install an air conditioning unit later on, and it had its own transformer. And so you had to be able to separate those two transformers, or you'd end up with phase problems and all that. So through even thermostats, you had RC for cooling, which was the cooling transformer, and RH for the heating transformer. Amazing the number of techs today out in the field that think RC is the common from the equipment transformer. True. Very, I mean, it's sad, but it's true. So they say, well, that's RC. Heck, I'll run that common right over there from the equipment transformer right in there. And guess what happened? <laughs> Fuses blow like crazy. You don't <laughs> wire the common to that. Ever, ever, ever. Not the equipment common. The only common that's coming in here is 24 volts from the Separate. Separate transformer. So, process of elimination. Now, there are other things that uh, you look at in zoning, depending on the type of system. Uh, you may be using a discharge air sensor, and we highly recommend discharge air sensors. You used to have to use mechanical devices, uh, uh, freeze stats, uh, before we got into microprocessor logic. Uh, because you always want to make sure that you're protecting the equipment. So you don't want to freeze a coil because you're bypassing a lot of air and all of a sudden your discharge air temperature gets to a point where you start frosting a coil. And you don't want to trip on uh, safety limits on equipment because nothing is more enjoyable than having to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and go out to a job that was zoned without limit control and by the time you get out there, well, it tripped three times, and now you have to go to the job, and yet you can't figure out why it did that. Because, you know, it tripped on limit, on high, or safety limit, because there was no limit control in the zoning panel. We have an input on every one of our panels for a discharge air sensor. And that discharge air sensor prevents coil freeze up and also prevents going out on safety limits because typically on the equipment today, three strikes, you're out. And now you've got to go out to the job and figure out, reset the furnace, get things running again. And they're all adjustable. So if it's heat pump, you got lower discharge air temperatures. If it's gas electric or even oil, you got higher discharge and you have selectable ranges you can put these in. But how do I, how do I even know if that thing is working? A discharge air sensor. Again, LEDs tell me if I'm tripped on limit. Now, when you get there, you may not be because you've tripped the fur, you know, if you trip the furnace out, but it, uh, I'll have a blinking LED. I'll have an indicator that says, oh, the equipment isn't running because I have tripped on either high or low limit. And when it does that, especially like in heat pump applications, we go into short cycle protection and we won't let the equipment come on. We keep the air handler running so that we get the temperature, uh, between the limit ranges and allow the equipment to come back on. But I don't even know if that sensor works 
Well, all go. I need is that, and I can I can tell you if it's if it's a working sensor or not. Now, the sensors used in the industry are thermistors. You're all familiar with them, thermistors. Um, we use 10K negative temperature coefficient thermistors. You don't even need to worry about that. A thermistor doesn't lose its calibration. In all the years that I've been in this industry and even got involved in thermistors, I've never seen a thermistor have a calibration problem. A thermistor will tell you exactly what the ohms value is, and that ohms value you can convert on a chart, or we can we do that all the time, and we can tell you exactly what the temperature is. Exactly what the temperature is. So the only thing that a sensor uh, can really, if it, if it is if it malfunctions or isn't functioning, is you're either going to see an open or a close on your meter. If you read ohm's value, in other words, if I see, oh, I got 10K on my meter, that's 77 degrees. I know that because that's what these thermistors are rated at. And negative temperature coefficient means uh, the lower the temperature, the higher the ohm's value. But if you, if you want to make sure that it works, here's just a little quick thing to remember. Don't ohm it out with the leads attached to the panel, to the terminals. It won't read right. Take the leads off and ohm the leads out. And if you see the value, you know, it's proper, or you say, well, I'm not sure what that is. Well, we can, we, we can provide you with the information or a temperature uh, chart that tells you the conversion between ohms values and temperature and you say oh that's right uh, we get this all the time on outdoor sensors when you use them for balance point control and the guy's saying oh man i don't read anything he's reading at the leads and then he goes outside and he sees where a wire nut broke or fell off and actually the sensor works fine it's just a wire problem going back to the panel so Keep that in mind whenever you do ohms checking on sensors, you always do it with the leads disconnected, not connected to the panel, because you'll it'll give you a misleading reading. Questions? I got one on here. Yes. Going back to um, the duct <laughs> design and the equivalent length, they were actually referencing uh, static pre related to static pressure, like the distance. Um, they're talking about duct design. <laughs> if you took a, if you, uh, if you have a home, and you do your 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 load calculations, you do your manual J's, everything properly, zone control does not affect that one bit, not one bit. If you if you do proper duct sizing, uh, without even consideration for a zoning system. A zone control system does not affect that one bit. You don't want to be oversized. You don't want to be undersized in your duct work. And the same with the equipment. You don't want to be grossly oversized with the equipment. You don't want to be undersized with the equipment. Now, years ago, there was a company that claimed that if you zone your house, you only need 50% of the equipment capacity. Yeah, right. Well, that didn't fly, guys. That happened out in the West Coast, uh, only because the assumption was, well, you use programmable thermostats. You only live in half your house, you know, at one time. And yeah, then your mother-in-law comes in to live there with you. Now everything changes. <laughs> and you may need 100% <laughs> of the load, and you don't have it. Well, that died real quick. But as long as the equipment sized properly, if you're oversized, you can have real problems. You'll short cycle the heck out of things. So you want to size the equipment properly, lay the ductwork out just like you would if you didn't have zone control. Other than the fact you have to remember, you got to get dampers in. That's it. There's no, there's no magic in, in doing uh, special calculations for a zoning system. Now, you do have to consider bypass. 
whether it's through the ESP feature on these panels or whether it's through conventional bypass. You have to bypass one way or the other because we have to maintain our system static pressure. Any other questions on that? Um, for, here we go. For discharged air temperature sensors, uh, what would cause them to read improperly? Um, saying a temp is 57 degrees, but actually the temp is 87 degrees. Um, nine times out of ten wire. Now, thermistors can be, uh, they, they can read false information back to a zoning panel, not because of the thermistor, but because of it being influenced by electromechanical um, uh, elements in the air. Uh, if you take, uh, if you use shielded cable, and this is highly recommended, uh, if you use shielded cable, especially for long runs, like remote sensors for thermostats, you, you uh, lessen the risk of that happening. But if you're running um, non-shielded cable to a sensor over ballast, fluorescent ballast, things like that, that can influence it, and it can do some wacky readings, and you'll say, what the heck's going on? Other than that, like I said, the thermistor doesn't fail. And if you're reading an improper value, typically it's a wire issue. It's not the thermistor. If you're not reading anything, or you got a closer and open, yeah, something's broke. <laughs> or you've got a wire that's totally disconnected. Um, another one here is, uh, with the thermistor, does it matter if it's linear or nonlinear at all? Uh, in these, in, in the thermistors that we use, and there are different types, these are not linear. They all form a curve. They're not, they're nonlinear. These are negative temperature coefficient thermistors. So there, it's not a linear line. It runs like that. And the further out you get, the, even, the further the curve, the more uh, advanced the curve gets. Um, but it doesn't matter. It depends on the type of zoning system and what it was designed or engineered to use. And most of the systems that I am familiar with use 10K, period. Yeah, like now they use 10K type 2, 10K type 3, and there is a little difference in the curve, but if you're in the general comfort ranges, there isn't that much difference. Got some questions here. Yes. So what he said, does it need to see the, the discharge sensor in order to operate? No. No. You, you, could, you can use a zone control panel without uh, a limit or a discharge air sensor. But what you potentially are risking is either, either you know, frosting a coil, freezing a coil up, or tripping on safety limits. And that's the reason they all zone control manufacturers have them you know in the system but there have been applications where they're not used and everything runs just fine you know but you're taking a chance when you do that and you and you know for a, a, a couple dollar part and it typically is part of the system it's worth putting it in are there bad locations to put that duck sensor are there bad locations to put yeah. that duck sensor yeah, I know, because you install them like that all the time, and then you call me up. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm picking on him because we, we, we've been around a while. <laughs> <laughs> you want to try to install a discharge air sensor, first of all, in the main supply plenum. Prior to transitions, zone dampers, or, you know, split off, takeoffs to go in different ways. You also want to try to get the discharge air sensor as far away from the evaporator or the heat exchanger as you can. Um, realistically, you can. You don't want it. I always prefer to try to get it away so it's not in line of sight of the evaporator or the heat exchanger. I want to get it downstream as far as I can. 
you, sometimes you don't can't get it downstream very far. But uh, at least 28 to 30 inches away. And if you can't do that, just wherever you can get it the furthest, that's where you should put it in. Because if you have it in line of sight or right on near the right on the heat exchanger, that yeah, you're gonna you risk it tripping on limit. Um, it's doing its job. It's just the fact you want to get it further away if you can. That way, you're you're mixing air, and uh, it's reading a truer temperature, which regards to the true discharge air temperature. Uh, yeah, you don't want to have it right on the heat exchanger, or you'll run into problems. Yeah. Same way with the evaporator. Uh, and remember, we're reading air temperature. So if we trip at 40 degrees, that's 40 degrees discharge air. Well, that's almost freezing the coil, guys. So that's why we trip. Because guys say, well, that's not cold enough. Yeah, it is cold enough. It, you know, if, if max or if, if design, if we can run 55 degree air, we're happier than we can be. And if I see that thing drop down to 40 degrees, I'm going to have problems. So that's where we trip at. Now, some of our panels are adjustable. You have adjustable high and low limits that you can adjust. But 40 is usually the low limit cap on that. Yes, anything else? Um, I have a question here that um, it's mainly talking about outside air, fresh air supply and commercial space. Um, it's asking what what panel would you suggest to use to control a few outside fresh air supplies for different floors in a commercial building. The problem is that most uh, changeover thermostats have a temperature log about three degrees, which is not acceptable. Once the temperature is low, a panel has to close the damper for not wanting for three degrees lower. Uh, we have commercial systems that the the panels were you know, talking about tonight, these are two position, power open, power close. But you don't have to power close the damper all the way because these have mechanical minimum position adjustment. Now in commercial applications, we start dealing with what we call modulating systems. Uh, the systems that, that uh, we sell commercially, more zone capability, of uh, some more bells and whistles, still doing the same thing. You're bringing everything back to a panel, but you have a thermostat that is is, is proprietary that allows uh, this damper to modulate. And inside that thermostat, um, it's called an SCZ20 uh, uh, panel, which is a 20 zone uh, panel. Our specified control group, uh, they, they sell that panel. Um, you can get it from us, from Jackson Systems, but uh, it's, it's a specified control product. Um, and they use a special thermostat. And this thermostat is really neat. Now, I don't have one here, and I don't want to get too involved in the commercial zoning applications. But to answer this question, we can provide minimum position of these dampers so that ASHRAE code, ventilation code, we even when we have satisfied the thermostat, we can go to a minimum position in all zones to allow a minimum amount of air, fresh air, into those zones rather than going 100% closed. And these thermostats come from the factory already set at 10%. So every thermostat would be 10%. If the, all the zones are satisfied, you're still inducing 10% minimum air into all the zones. And that meets the ventilation. Now, we're not dealing with bringing in the fresh air, but that allows the air handler to move the air throughout all the zones, even, well, even though they haven't called. And that's actually a great segue for our online viewers. Next yeah. week, we're going to be doing a commercial <laughs> zoning. There you so, go. Go in there. Yeah, this commercial guy <laughs> back here just raising his hand and everything. OK, any other questions? Pretty good. I know I speak fast. <laughs> Um, and my biggest problem over the years is I could talk for hours and hours and hours, and uh, they're going to cut me off here. Uh, I greatly appreciate the opportunity, especially with this group, uh, to speak to our local guys. And uh, uh, I think we're going to have some fun uh, tonight. Uh, it's, it's nothing super technical. Uh, you're going to have the opportunity to diagnose. We're going to have to do teams because we've got a big group of people. Okay. 
So gonna, I don't know, maybe three guys. We're going to log out for our online viewers for here oh, first good. real quick. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you uh, had a great time listening to Phil. That's right. And if you <laughs> if you're all right, you know, write in, uh, send mail, letters and all that. And I may stick around for another couple of years. So. <laughs> um, just remember, um, this is able to view 48 hours after using the same link. So if you missed anything, you can come back and join us. Um, we're going to have the 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 more live trainings. Um, commercial zoning is next week, right, Mike? All right. Um, if you do have questions on the job, please call us. We are here from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. No matter where you are in the country, we have live people that answer the phones. Um, there's our phone number. You can also email us. Uh, well, if you want to have some more trainings or have a Suggestions, thank you. More trainings that we can do here for you. Please email the training email. Good night. Good night. <laughs>